in this half hour, a conversation with Mario Gabelli on investing on value on, well, on this great and most unloved bull market. We end 2017, we begin 2018. Once again, humbled the intellectual certitude. It's gonna be a single digit world. You're only gonna make single digit returns. And then year after near year after year, the reality of good and indeed like this year, outstanding double digit returns in the stock market. On investing, on value, must listen worldwide. Mario uh, Gabelli, and of course, all of this part of the Bloomberg surveillance year ahead special. I'm Tom Keane, thrilled you're with us from our world headquarters in New York. We talked to Howard Ward the other day, your colleague in crime, up 29%, up 28%. Who's counting? How do the optimists like you stay invested when year after year there's a theory and certitude that we're just going to grind out single digit returns? You know, that's a great question because when we look at a company, we're not buying a stock, we're buying the business. <clears throat> How is the business run? How does the management come to work every day to make money for their shareholders? How do they deal with the cash flow? Mm -hmm. How do they allocate it? And so, Tom, we try to figure out what's the company going to be worth in the next five years, much like a private equity firm. So we gather the data, rate the data, project it, interpret, and then say, okay, where's our margin of safety? And, you know, can we make... And so some years we're, we're going to be down. Uh, we've been down four or five years now over the last 45. It's what's much... your worst drawdown ever? Down 30%? No. <laughs> it was that one week... That one week on October 19th to the October 26th of 1987, yeah. the markets were down 30%, Tom. That was just terrific. You celebrate your 40th anniversary of doing this. You started out, and one of the great things about Mario Gabelli, folks, is he was in the trenches of securities analysis. He actually read cover to cover, Graham Dowd and Cottle. A lot of people talk about it. Few people actually read it. You did it in the trenches. You set up Gabelli in 77. What about that event 10 years after that that we celebrated the anniversary of this year? What do the young kids miss today about those big, big market drawdowns? No, I think, you know, when I lecture at various schools or I recruit at schools, they're all, you know, you can feel the interest, in, including the academics, about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, yeah. about blockchain. You know, the numbers they project up, they don't say how many are there in the circulation or what the price is, and it's a $250 billion market cap right. mark, and it's, they want to go to 100000 and that's, you know, the amounts are staggering. They don't look at it from that dimension, and they look at it as something new, something exciting, and they've never been burned in, don't have any understanding that, you know, there are reactions okay. to the market. But that's okay. That's, you have to expect that. We're going to set this up, folks, with the media. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then we're going to talk about industrials and then the bigger, broader view that Mr. Gabelli has for 2018. But this is fun because you know Mario Gabelli from his great work over the years that must read a punditry in Barron's is one example. So let's go to an individual stock and I'm consuming it. I walked down onto the set here, and here I was with my daily dose. I have Cheez-Its, thank you, Mike, and Snyder's pretzels, and of course, Mario gave me the equity history. Would you like a Snyder's pretzel? I'll take some later. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm not a big fan. I like the pretzels, but not. The, I don't like, okay. I just like the old-fashioned sourdough. This sour is dough. classic Gabelli. Give us a history of how you tried to make profits with Snyder's of Hanover. No, 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 let's be very careful. The consumer today loves snacking. You came out, you were eating that yesterday afternoon. And we had been following uh, Lance for a long period of time. They merged with a private company called Schneider's, duh, the pretzel company. These are things technically and technologically uh, that doesn't take a great deal of mindset to understand. You take a bite, you understand. Really? It. Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> it's amazing. And so what happened is the stock was there. They bought the company. They issued stock. A family out of Pennsylvania became a large shareholder. And they went and did uh, direct store delivery. They changed the distribution. They went uh, a variety of ways. And then about, uh, I'm going to cuff this, Tom, two or three years ago, they bought a company on the West Coast called Diamond uh, The uh, Nut People, yeah. Yeah. And as a result, that company had gone up sharply. They had a problem with the way they did some pricing. And uh, the stock came back. So fast forward, new management changes. Yesterday afternoon, yesterday being in the middle of uh, uh, December, they basically announced or somebody speculated that they were schmoozing with someone. That is perhaps talking about a deal. 
So Denise Morrison at Campbell's Soup would love to own a snacking business. She's talked about this. She's bought some other products. And that was the in quote speculation. So you're walking out. Right. Stock was up $5 mm -hmm. yesterday. It's up two today. It's 46. There's a 100 plus million shares. And that's what we talked about. Okay. That's classic Gabelli here. Now I want to talk about how you have patience. And a lot of people had to have eight patience with Bob Iger and with Disney for years. It's just so sort of, okay, a pretty good story. And then with your expertise in the media, you see the moonshot of Disney over the last X number of years. And now the shock of 2017 and Mr. Murdoch. First of all, have you spoken to either Mr. Murdoch or Mr. Iger? No, I uh, basically have known them uh, forever. The stock came out last week. I really don't want to step into knowledge, so I deal with the public knowledge that everyone has as mm -hmm. an official. I've known uh, Disney when Eisner was running, and even before that, as a rookie analyst, I would go and cover the movie industry in the mid 60s. I used to write stories about Cinderella and what would happen every seven years when the cycle changed. But independent of that, uh, uh, you know, Iger was a uh, Tom Murphy and D uh, Dan Burke hired him to run right. Cap Cities. They merged into ABC. They merged into Disney, and he's done a very good job. So now let's think about what's changed, though, Tom. The global marketplace: seven and a half billion people. Sixty years ago, there were fifty, mm -hmm. uh, two and a half billion. Mobile phones, you can watch television. I can watch Tom Key now on a mobile device, and there's going to be four and a half billion of those things. And so how do you also deal with Gen Z and Gen Y? And you want a podcast, you want to go short uh, uh, stories. So now comes along Netflix. Then you have direct to the consumer with a product. The old media have content, but they don't have that channel distribution. of distribution. Yeah. So that's the challenge. So all of a sudden, somehow, Rupert decides that maybe he needs scale. He's looking at these behemoths, these giant companies, Alphabet, Google, uh, Amazon, Amazon Mr. and Mr. Yeah. so on, and they have market caps of six to eight hundred billion dollars, and they're fragmenting the media, the television advertising pie is five hundred and fifty billion. The digital is taking forty to fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So he's probably saying to himself, "What do I do?" Meanwhile, he understands financial engineering. He spuns off News Corp. News Corp was so uh, spun off. He controls that. There's uh, so he's saying to himself, "What do I do?" Meanwhile. Iger's doing the same thing at Disney. And how do we get into this global marketplace? It's not a meeting of the minds. Okay, within this, and this is so important, maybe this links in the same thing from Snyder's pretzel over to uh, the media, is you gotta know where to go 12 months out, five years out. You're the king of patience. Well, uh, also there's the other part, and that is the tax rate is 23.8% on long-term gains, is 40 odd percent on short-term gains. And you wanna keep with that 23% and you wanna number. Keep, and you wanna keep what you okay. make. But w within this, I remember a million years ago with Gabelli, I think it was called Value Trust, you own John Malone and Tacoma and telecommunications and yeah, all that. What do you own now looking out to 2020 or to 2025 oh, in media? Well, let's do it first, globalization. Please. Secondly, we're talking about yesterday, the net neutrality concept was changed so that if I'm driving a big truck on the George Washington Bridge, I'm going to pay $20 or $30 to go over as a toll. I'm driving a passenger car with my easy pass, I'm going to pay a lot less. So in net neutrality, they're changing that. So if you want to get unfettered content, dedicated content, you're going to pay. Meanwhile, the Netflixes of the world have been using someone else's highway and not yeah. paying. So that's changed. So that's going to create a new ecosystem. What it means, though, is that a wireless company, wireless broadband, a company like Verizon that's well run, can earn, generate significant returns, paying 5%, and it's got a couple of mark, $100 billion market cap. So how are they going to go global? How are they going to go direct to the consumer with new products? So where do you place your capital at the margin? Are you attracted to the 5% dividend of Verizon and you use Gabelli Patience? Or are you buying some micro cap yeah, wireless? Stock, I don't know. I know. That stock is also going up. But the, 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 what I'm doing is global. So what companies that we like will be taken Please, over? Please, some names. Millicom. Millicom is 100 million shares low, is, uh, controlled by uh, Christine Stenbeck out of Stockholm. They are uh, the cable and television operator in Latin America, uh, Colombia, uh, Paraguay, you know, Interesting. all the parts. And so that company will be merged with Lilac, which mm -hmm. is the company that Malone has his fingerprints all over. And that'll take another year or two. But it'll work. And the stock is $55, $65. They're going to sell all their African assets. They're going to focus on this market, and you'll make 50%. So 50% in three years is 17%. Uh, and it pays us a dividend, which I'd hope they eliminate. Secondly, in the United States, there's a company that extraordinarily uh, 
uh, undervalued called U.S. Cellular out of Chicago. But the guy that runs it, Carlson and I, have had arm wrestling saying that he should buy in the 19% he doesn't own. Uh, the stock is trading at $35. And they really have uh, not done a good mm -hmm. job of enhancing shareholder values. They've got wireless, uh, uh, they've got uh, tower assets, they've got spectrum that they can sell. Mm -hmm. They have a 4.8 percent in LA, so I like that one. And it's uh, you know in 83 million shares, but the telephone and data system. So in addition to that, Tom, there's smaller ones. AT&T, Time Warner, 30 seconds. Should the government let this transaction go through this vertical? Combination. Well, you know, Time Warner, uh, AT&T has got a small, uh, it's got a $200 billion market cap. They're paying you $107, half cash, half stock, with the telephone stock at 107, uh, telephone stock at 37 and a half. I think there are certain aspects that maybe they want to examine, mm -hmm. but on balance, vertical uh, uh, mergers are okay. The horizontal one at Disney is a little more challenging in the sense that you've got two movie studios coming together. Yeah. And uh, on the other side, the world well, has changed. You know that uh, Tom Dillon got a, a, a Nobel Prize for his song, The Times They Are Changing. Bob well, Dillon, yes. Bob Dillon. Tom was his brother. I'm thinking yeah. of you. Uh, I, I was no Bob Dillon. Let's well, do this. Tom Let's Dillon. come back with Mario Gabelli. We're doing a half hour. We ought to be doing five or six hours with Mario Gabelli. We didn't even get to Les Moonves and CBS there. That's terrible. Coming back. Do you own GE? We'll find out if Mario Gabelli owned GE or would he load the boat here under $20 a share? Stay with us. surveillance our year ahead special looking into 2018 and there's no one better to talk equity markets we're going to do a little bit of economics and what's president trump doing in that we'll do that later right now mario gabelli on jack welch one of my themes for next year's pricing power the idea that we have um challenges with inflation and such at the top line is a general statement will we have pricing power I, that depends on the company and the industry. And so to the degree that I am selling a premium product to the seven and a half billion people in the world <coughs> and a product they want, for example, what I do is I sell Irish whiskey. And then on top of Irish whiskey, I come up with a new product above the Jameson price. So the pricing power is not only ability to pass through a higher rising cost, particularly labor, which I think and I share with you that it will go up and it should, and it's been a long time since it hasn't that uh, you can raise price on the existing product or you offer a premium product right. that prices up. And I think the uh, certain, uh, and appropriately at Christmas time, the distilled spirits companies have that pricing flexibility. Right. Oh, so I, I believe what you're saying and I think right. it makes sense. Maybe Jeff Emmel will, have, uh, Emmel will have a distilled spirit this year after this year with General Electric. Did you own General Electric and did you write it down? Uh, we own General Electric. We don't like large companies that were not going to be taken over as our primary because sure. we believe the ignored and unloved Tom is still <clears throat> small and nano cap, small and medium cap companies because that's where, in quotes, the action will be in 2018. That's where mergers and financial engineering will take place. But GE dropped to $9 during the financial crisis. So, yes, we bought it then because we figured they would work their way out of some of the leasing business, much like Textron, mm -hmm. which <laughs> dropped. It was a small cap stock nine, eight years ago. So we could buy it for a certain mandates. Today, GE, with 8.7 billion shares, selling mm -hmm. at uh, uh, 17 and a half, I suggest we put a few chips down and allow Flannery. They have a <clears throat> world-class engines business. They have one of the best. The guy that runs it is terrific. And I think they can earn a, a, a okay. buck and a half in three years. Here's the money question then on GE, and this leads into a conversation on industrials, just absolutely critical uh, right now. I would suggest Flannery's timeline is different than it would have been 10 years ago or 30 years ago. The new five-year plan is three years. The new three-year plan is can we get out to, to uh, conference calls. The, the timeline shrunk down for management performance, hasn't it? Well, I think it's different. I think the investor has relegated his understanding of a long-term creation <clears throat> of American industry, American wealth, and how do we do that in the future? 
and they become more instantly oriented, and that's where you're going. But the surrogates, the ETFs, mm -hmm. the electronically traded funds, they have no corporate governance. They're buying a piece of paper. They're buying a commodity, Tom. And as a result of that, they've lost their governance. They don't know how to govern in the sense of how do they vote. They'll vote for cobalt but they don't, in, uh, uh, in Africa, right. but they won't vote necessarily for the company specifics. They can't do it. They're not set up economically to do it. There are successful stocks, I'm thinking of Dana or DHR, where it's just a linear function of prosperity up, up, up. How do you, def how do you find new industrial Danahers, the companies that are mid cap or even a lesser mid cap, where you're gonna go, you know, this isn't a takeout, we're never gonna sell this thing, where it's a true Gabelli buy and hold. Well, you're right, because you know our holding period is 10 or 12 years. And as a result, and the reason on the average our portfolios have that kind of turnover mm -hmm. is that companies take them over. When Warren Buffett pro bought Precision Cast Parts, we wouldn't have sold it. We bought it when it was called Standard Press Steel. They bought it for stock, and uh, we would have still owned it. But Warren buys it, so that causes it to turnover. So how do I find a company that has the management, that looks for niches in the industrial worlds? We've been holding Amatech, in Phil uh, uh, Pennsylvania-based company, uh, for probably uh, 15 years. They basically take their cash flow, Tom, they have very little CapEx uh, reinvestment, so they have good cash flow. They're largely domestic, so they'll benefit enormously from the new tax changes. And the management sits down and says, okay, where do we find these little niches? And uh, right. that's what they, they just bought a company we own called Mocon, and they're gonna do a lot of synergistic benefits. IDEX out of right. Chicago is another. <clears throat> and today we're looking at companies like Crane that have these capabilities. But also large companies don't ignore. Honeywell has done this very successfully. What, I did the chart the other day. Honeywell, Moonshot, GE rolls over. What did David do there that was so extraordinary? He uh, tried to make love to GE, remember? I remember. Uh, uh, the two of them years yeah, ago. And this other guy, Mario, uh, something broke the deal in Europe. And so now the question is, what's left in GE? They're getting skinny to get fat. So this is called basically going on a corporate diet, leaning out, and getting your core competencies and driving them at GE. Honeywell basically had good businesses with a strong tailwind. Is the trick to a Honeywell, a Danner, and other success stories, your success years ago with Cadbury Schweppes, is it not what they do or is it what they don't do? Is that the trick no, to the I, you know, I, that's an interesting question and looking at the different facets of what makes a, a, a company. I like a good business with a moat around it that they protect, whether it's a niche that's so small that nobody wants, where you handle your mm -hmm. margins right, but also how does management allocate cash flow? What does make Buffett so unique? Is it his ability to figure out what railroad engines are gonna do? Or, but it's how do you allocate cash flow? And how do you help shareholder values? So we find companies all the time, Tom, nano caps, micro caps, small, and by the way, we're starting to see these emerging in the global marketplace. Okay, uh, and then sometimes you have the ugly duckling. Mm -hmm. When Herc Rentals was spun off from Hertz, Hertz had done a lot of stupid things, and that stock was 28. We knew that the Larry Finks of the world, that is the ETFs, couldn't own them. So we just stood there with a basket. We own 15% of the company. The stock's gone from 28 to 63. We're going to come back. Mario Gabelli with us uh, talking auto leasing. We're going to come back. Mario Gabelli, he mentioned it earlier, the tax legislation. Who knows where that's going? What we're going to do is talk to Mr. Gabelli about the state of the nation. Mario Gabelli on the Trump administration and the view forward. Stay with us. Surveillance. We are looking the year ahead, and it's good to do that with Mario Gabelli. What an interesting life it's been for Mr. Gabelli. He is not aged. He is not grizzled. He is vibrant and working day after day in a new country, in a new place. You came out of Fordham Prep. You had an interesting path of really beginning to do securities analysis right from the beginning. What is the state of America so different from when you came out of Fordham Prep years ago? It really is not much, Tom. It's basically you got to put in the effort. So instead of working nine to five, five to nine still works in America. The second part is you also have to have achievements. And in that context, how do you put it all together? So the notion of staying focused where your passion is really drives a lot right. of people. 
And uh, so that not had to change. But when you step back and look at this country, okay, I graduated from Columbia Business School and I owed money. But what allowed me to be successful? The rule of law with all of the problems, the free market system with all of the problems and the need for some life support, uh, like credit, uh, earned income credits would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then ed a meritocracy and education is the foundation of that. That's why we give back so much. You've been front and center in philanthropy and you did it early when no, really nobody knew your name and it was small amounts. You did a fitness center out in, in the West Coast like a small amount. No, of, University of Nevada. University Reno. of Nevada. UNR. Excuse me, that's close to the West Coast. Stay with me on this, Mario. You're part of the donor class, and you've been part of the donor class. How does the donor class, besieged right now within the tax debate and all, how does the donor class speak to the rest of America? Well, I think it's not only to the rest of America, it's to the rest of the world. And that is basically the answer is that we have a responsibility to continue the last 250 years that have made this a unique experiment in mankind's history in this country and to continue that process and allow those elements that work to continue to work. And we have to have open and friendly debates. We have to have a, a philosophy of nurturing everyone. So student debt is a problem that we have to solve. What would you do about student debt? You, I would allow you the had loans the whole way. You were not, I, all, not, you, not the whole way, but I had a lot of Come scholarships, on. but I did borrow. Yeah. <clears throat> and I uh, essentially allow the students to have interest deduction, allow the students to take intellectual property like you would a piece of equipment, depreciate it against earned income so that you'd have some kind of a, a, a stake. And the third part is obviously do what Governor Cuomo in New York mm -hmm. is doing, enlarge the, uh, the base of free education, go back to a, a basically a mayor. You've got to be smart to get into certain schools. Live with that. And then have education open, and then re-educate, re-educate mm -hmm. senior citizens that are being displaced by the technology dynamics. Mm -hmm. So that's not just stay focused on. Make out, you and I were here in 1944, and we created Project Manhattan, and we put the best minds and said, let's focus on this issue because it is dragging down the right. millennials and the Gen Zs and their parents and the system. The kid shows up at Cabelli, or you interview him, or you got a family friend who says the kid's got a PhD in quantitative finance, blah blah, Greek no, 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 letters, no, this, yeah. this, this. You would dismiss him in a heartbeat. What do you tell the math-centric investment person? today? How do they get the tangible management analysis, which is your... Experience? I have no problem with quants. <laughs> Some of my family friends are quants. Independent of that, we do like to have social media. We like to have coders in our firm. We go to Worcester Polytech and interview there. Mm -hmm. we'll, we haven't done it yet. We're going to do it. But in addition to that, Tom, we, our PhDs are poor, hungry, and driven. Mm -hmm. Privileged, hungry, and driven, maybe. Okay, we want individuals that have a passion for the uh, dynamics of the capital markets on a global basis and you got to unfortunately yeah. you got to fly from Paris to Shanghai and uh, everywhere in the world and I got to admit I've never heard you more global than you are uh, today Mario Gabelli thank you so much greatly greatly appreciate it terrific perspective here on a view forward really with a much more international view than I uh, uh, than I uh, really expected Mario Gabelli is chairman and chief executive officer of Gabelli and uh, Gamco investors as uh, well. There is so much more to talk about for Bloomberg Surveillance this year, for our entire team, for Francine, John Farrell, Pim Fox and all. We're really looking forward to 2018 because we don't have a clue what's going to happen and people like Mario Gabelli, people like Ed Hyman and others are going to try to give us some expert wisdom as we move forward. That's it. Bloomberg Surveillance, year ahead for all of us at Bloomberg we can say have a great 2018.